Welcome to this touchstone for Easter week. Today is Thursday, April 8th. We are launching this touchstone a day late. And there were a lot of reasons for the timing around that. I am, however, going to reflect a little on the reading still from yesterday, from Wednesday, when we usually put out our touchstone, because it is the story of the road to Emmaus, the amazing, well-known scripture from that 24th chapter of Luke. The story of the disciples and Jesus on the road to Emmaus is one that, while familiar, I think, as an overarching story, has a lot of details we don't always notice. It is a long story. It goes from, in that 24th chapter of Luke, it goes from verse 13 clear to 35. It's a long story, and for a daily reading, it's exceptionally long. And the story is often seen as a reflection of how these two disciples walking the road encounter Jesus and don't recognize Jesus. And I think that it's unfortunate that in a story that is inundated and saturated with resurrection and hope and the newness of life and how Jesus appears so new to them they don't even recognize him that we've turned it around into a sort of story of how sad it is that they didn't have the faith and the eyes to recognize him. It's an invitation to new sight. It's an invitation to look at the situation in front of us with eyes of great hope, eyes that trust transformation. We don't have to see it as a scolding. It talks to us about the miracles that happen when we learn to walk our journey together and how we have walked journeys together over the years has changed who all of us are. The people with whom you choose to share your journey will shape your life in ways you can't imagine. I've spoken so much about our journey this year into a world of masks and social distance and all of the other fun involved in a pandemic. And I've spoken about how we're going to journey out of this. I've explained over and over again that we are never called back to how it used to be, the way we always did it. Our journey with Jesus, our Emmaus road with Jesus, Jesus calls us forward to something new, even as we are called back to what is familiar. It will always be the next normal, the new normal, a transformed normal. And in the next six weeks, we're going to be called back to something very familiar. We're also going to be called in the next three months to something new. So. We have received notice from the Archdiocese that at Pentecost, which is about six weeks away, at Pentecost, the dispensation from the obligation to attend Mass on Sundays, that is, when a year ago when the bishops of Colorado said, you are no longer obligated to come to Mass on Sundays for the sake of the pandemic, in six weeks, that dispensation goes away and the obligation as a Catholic to attend Mass falls back into place. Now, people will panic over that, but there's a few things to recognize. And, and I'm not softening the blow. This is coming directly from the Archdiocese. The obligation to attend Mass has always had certain flexibilities to it. You are not, and they're going to spell more of these out, you're not obligated to attend Mass if you are homebound, if you can't get out of the house. Uh, being added to that will be, you know, if you've 
been exposed that you know to the virus, or to uh, COVID, if you have a fever, if you are sick, don't come to Mass. The obligation is lifted at that moment for you. If you are caring for someone who is at risk, if you are in an at-risk category yourself, then the obligation, you know, it is not something you need to allow to push you into an uncomfortable situation. Likewise, you may not be able to make the obligation because of space. We will still have to have sign-ups. There, there will still be limits of how many people can come in. We'll be able to raise our numbers. Right now, we're supposed to be allowed 50% as long as we can social distance. Well, depends on whether social distance is six feet or three feet and how that changes and how that will affect how many people we can have in the room. Lunch. Our expectation is that we will continue on an every other week basis for people signing up for Mass. And we will get close to 200 at a Mass between what we can fit in the church and in the new parish center. Between those two spaces, if we can get 200 at a Mass, four Masses a weekend, 800, that's 1,600 every two weeks. We actually think that will be as many people as are able to safely come back for now. But it's going to be something approaching what we've known. It will be normal. It will also be a new normal and a next normal. I've said that so many times this year. I started out last year with the story of Lazarus. And talking about the kind of resurrection that we hope puts us back to where we were before we got sick, before we got broken, before we got in trouble, whatever it was, can God restore us to our former self? That's the resurrection of Lazarus. The resurrection of Jesus pushes through death to new life and brings us to somewhere we've never been before. That's the new for us as Christians in the idea of a new normal a next normal. I've been playing with the idea of a transfigured normal. Now, not too often in my life, but often enough, I have found myself swimming in a moment that demands I take my own advice at a deeper level than I was ever expecting or imagining. A moment when the message that I've been preaching to all of you, I have to listen to and preach to myself a little more deeply. And I must tell you, I am right now in one of those moments. While we're going to be heading back into the normalcy of, of life after COVID, the Archdiocese of Denver has called me to a new parish assignment, effective this July. And so after 17, amazing years, I will be leaving Most Precious Blood this summer. In the months ahead, I have so many things I know I'm going to want to say, so many expressions of gratitude to so many. I'm going to have so many thoughts I want to share. But for now, I want to concentrate on one thing, and that is just what an amazing joy and honor and life-giving experience it has been to pastor this community. Five years ago, many of you may remember when I announced I was getting to stay beyond the usual 12-year pastoral assignment. And while I know that many people are going to be very upset that the diocese is moving, that, that they are moving me, these past five years have been an unexpected gift that they afforded me. I'm, I'm in a space right now where I am very grateful to the Archdiocese for that gift. I am keenly aware that the same local Archdiocesan church that is moving me to a new pastoral assignment moved me to a new pastoral assignment 17 years ago so that I could encounter this community in the first place. 
There are no villains in this story. Pastoring this parish and this school and this ELC and this community in this neighborhood, it has been the most wonderful experience of my life. While I have sometimes fantasized after being here for 17 years that I would one day retire here, you know, another 12 or 15 years from now, I think deeper down I've always understood and known that the Archdiocese would almost certainly eventually call me to another ministry, to another pastor. There are, I am sure, many questions going through many people's minds at this moment. Who's coming? Where am I going? And those are things I can share with you this weekend. We are asked not to share those ahead of time because in the same way that me leaving this parish is a message that you have a right to hear from me, and so I'm hoping this touchstone will reach as many people before the weekend as possible. Every pastor, every priest leaving a parish should have that ability to tell their own parish. So I'm telling you that now, but where I'm going, that involves someone else leaving their parish. Who's coming here? That involves someone else leaving their parish. And those priests have the right to tell their own parish. The diocese will let all of us know who's going where, all of the priests, on Friday, tomorrow. And then Saturday evening Mass, priests will announce they're moving all over the diocese. And at that point, someone could hear this news from someone else. Father John Doe could say, I'm the new pastor at Most Precious Blood, and I would not want you to have to have heard that from Father Doe. There is no Father Doe. Well, I'm sure there is, but there's no Father Doe coming here. <laughs> um, you have a right to hear that from me. So I promise this weekend I will have a little more information. It's been 17 years. We have kids who are graduating high school who have no real memory of any pastor but me. I've been afforded a generation at most precious blood. This Emmaus story is the story of three people encountering each other on the road. And at first, they don't trust one another. They look at Jesus and say, do you not know what's going on? Have you not heard the story? Who are you? And slowly as they begin to trust one another, they share the word of God and in a very short time, build enough of a rapport that they can see the Eucharist in one another and feel pain at the loss. I think we have had that Emmaus journey in 17 years. Trust me, when I got here, there were some raised eyebrows. When I first had to change the Mass schedule on Sunday to accommodate a third Mass, there were some raised eyebrows. When I uh, changed First Communions to just small groups of children, 10 at a time, at a normal Sunday Mass, there were some raised voices with eyebrows. And we slowly learned to trust one another and see the Word of God and see the Eucharist in one another. I hope that our 17 years together opens you and me up to be ready to experience that relationship again. Me with another community and you with another pastor. But that fire that burned in their hearts, that will stay with me. And I hope some of that will stay with you. Let us really keep one another in prayer over these next several weeks. We will have so much more to say on this to one another. Father, did you see the note there for God bless. Mom? Be safe and be well. Something there about your um, Naviance or whatever it's called. 